And, and thank you all for coming back. Um, if you're anything like me, you're probably in food coma. We'll try to fight food coma with uh, an engaging uh, conversation. I'm really honored to moderate this panel with uh, our esteemed panelists. Um, the section, the session uh, covers a number of topics, digital uh, cash, uh, CBDC, and cross-border payments. And uh, we are grateful to have these thought leaders uh, here this afternoon. Um, I'll let the uh, panelists introduce themselves as we kind of move through the conversation. But I want to start us off with uh, an audience and panel poll. I'm going to give you three statements. And if you support one of the three statements, uh, you know, show us uh, by raising your hand. Um, central banks and existing service providers will play a larger role in the future payments landscape. How many of you support that statement? Okay. How about central banks and uh, existing service providers will play the same role in the future as they do today? Okay, very few, fewer, fewer numbers of people. Um, how many of you believe that existing service providers will go the way of Kodak, Blockbuster, Pam Am, with new entrants dominating the payments landscape? Okay. Just a few of you. What's interesting is, is it looks like the majority of the folks, um, and I'm, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by what our panelists have, have said, which is that um, the existing service providers will play uh, a larger role in the future. Um, you know, in this session, we're going to have an opportunity to learn more about the work that is going on in the payments landscape um, and get uh, their perspectives on innovations in retail payments, wholesale and cross-border payments. So let's start the conversation um, with innovations in retail payments. Uh, many of you, uh, uh, or the last panel spoke a lot about PICS, um, so why don't we start off with Carlos and PICS. Carlos, can you introduce yourself and tell us more about what's going on in Brazil? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Julapa, for inviting me here, and it's a great opportunity to, to share uh, what we are doing in, in Brazil. Uh, well, my name is Carlos Brandt. I'm the head of uh, PIX uh, Management and Operations at the Central Bank of Brazil. Um, I think I'll, I'll start here uh, by saying uh, that the Central Bank of Brazil is taking a more active role in, in, in that retail payment space. Uh, we do believe that uh, uh, private companies have a very important role in innovation in providing the service but also the central bank has a very important role in organizing everything, coordinating uh, uh, the actors, uh, the stakeholders, and that's what we are doing in PIX. I mean, PIX is a, is a payment scheme. Uh, it's a fast payment scheme, uh, which has been implemented by the Central Bank of Brazil. It sets basic rules and basic standards, uh, UX requirements, user experience requirements for, for the PSPs. But of course, the PSPs, the payment service providers, are uh, very much uh, welcome to, and they have a lot of room for innovating over the PIX platform, so building new products on the, over the PIX platform and so on. Um, I think PIX, uh, as, as you might know, has has had a massive adoption uh, in, in Brazil. We have reached uh, last August, last month, the mark of 4 billion uh, transactions per month, which is more than, uh, than twice the, the transactions of credit cards, more than twice the transactions of, of debit cards in, in just two years of operations. Uh, and I think uh, it's fair enough to say that we are uh, achieving public objectives uh, with PIX in terms of speed. So we have uh, an instant uh, transaction. It doesn't take uh, two days to settle as, as it is in the debit card scheme. Uh, in Brazil, 30 days for the big credit card scheme. Uh, we have seen a, a lot of cost reduction uh, with PIX. So if you compare the cost of acceptance uh, with credit card in Brazil, on average, 2.3%. Uh, in debit card 1.10, and with PIX 0.20, almost 0.3, but 0.29 on average. So we've seen cost reduction. Uh, we have seen also a lot of um, financial inclusion. So uh, almost 70 million people in Brazil 
which is almost one third of the, the, the whole population of Brazil, uh, has been included and has been uh, uh, starting to to making digital payments uh, with Pix. So that's that's also a very important mark in terms of uh, uh, public objectives. Uh, but we also not do only or not implement not have implemented only the instant payment system. But we we have also implemented the open finance framework, which is uh, which is already live. Uh, we are also um, developing uh, the CBDC, which is so which is called so-called DREX. Uh, I, I hear a, a lot about uh, why we should have a CBDC if we already have peaks and so on, but the CBDC in Brazil, at least in our case, is for specific use cases, for financial products, for uh, tokenized assets, for programmable money and so on. Uh, so just to conclude here my, my initial remarks, uh, we do believe that uh, the central banks have to take a very active role in, in pushing the market and coordinating the market to, to, to have the innovation and instant payments, CBDC and open financing joining forces together. Uh, we believe that we can really provide uh, a very complete set of solutions to, to the Brazilian market. Thanks, Carlos. I think you just uh, highlighted why PIX is, is the envy of the world right now, along with uh, maybe the uh, UPI in India. Um, Alonso, may I ask you to introduce yourself and also share some of the developments going on in Costa Rica? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Alonso Alfaro Ureña. I'm the chief economist at the Central Bank of Costa Rica. And I'm here especially to tell you a bit about our uh, payment system, our instant payment system that we have been uh, working on for several years. To put, the, uh, to put first into context, Costa Rica is a very small country. We're 5 million people. We're in a Central American country. Probably you haven't necessarily heard about our payment system, but I want to, uh, to tell you a bit about it. The first of all is that um, you need to remember that we are a Latin American country. We're a developing country, and we've, uh, within that context, since 97, we've started developing uh, an electronic payment system. It's starting in 97, it became easier to make transactions from one bank to the other. In 2015, we uh, set forth this uh, program, this system, in which you can make transactions just using your cell phone number. For example, I have a bank account and I have my cell phone number and I link my bank account to this system and uh, I just need to know uh, another one's, uh, another person's cell phone uh, number, and I make a real-time transaction free um, up to $150 or so uh, per day. This started growing a lot, and during the pandemic, it exploded. Right now, we're doing 40 million transactions. It doesn't sound impressive, but remember that we are a 5 million uh, country people, uh, country, so 5 million people country. So this means that uh, it, more than 83% of the adult population are using it. It's great because you don't need to know the other person's bank account. You don't need to know uh, which cell phone provider they have. You just need to uh, know their phone number. One day, um, I did an experiment. I, I usually like to go to the farmer's market and I forgot to take out cash. And this is basically a cash market. You go and, and pay with, your, uh, with cash everything, all the groceries you, you want to buy. And I forgot to take out cash and I made the, the goal of testing how easy it would be to make all the payments using this. And it's called Simpe uh, System of Payments, Electronic System of Payments, Mobile, Simpe Mobile. And I was able to make all of the transactions, buying from $1 things to $10 things, everything in real time, and it's trusted by the people. And it's, uh, you just show them, I made the transaction, everything is great. To do this, it was necessary that people uh, have bank accounts. And we moved from a, not a very developed financial system in which everyone uh, had a bank account to simplify the process of opening bank accounts. So uh, right now we moved from around 60% of adult population having bank accounts to close to 80, 90% of people having bank accounts. So this allowed for everyone to uh, 
to become part of this. We also believe that we have, it's, the intention of this is not to substitute necessarily other forms of payment, but we have a very uh, clear goal to regulate and facilitate other uh, systems of uh, other payments in the system. Um, we are currently regulating the merch down, mer uh, merchant uh, rates that the, the card payments have to, to pay because they were very high. But we also are uh, pushing forward regulation to make it easier or to make it uh, strict that every merchant has to have uh, uh, pay, uh, I mean, a touch-based touch, touch -based, uh, technology to receive payments. So all the cards in Costa Rica now have the, the, the technology necessary to make uh, touch-based payments. Finally, there is one thing that we are pushing forward. Most of the transactions, or at least half of the transactions in cash in Costa Rica are made in the public transport system, which is a very scattered, not very organized uh, system. So we are um, implementing, implementing the payment system of, uh, within the infrastructure of SIMPE to make it uh, necessary for the, the, all the bosses to receive these instant payments uh, with uh, based technology and if we achieve that then probably 90 percent of all the transactions in Costa Rica that were uh, used uh, were made using cash will now be electronic so this is the the, the story that I had to tell you which is uh, of how a small country has been developing this payment system and it has allowed for universalization of financial accounts and easier and faster and more secure payment system with uh, technology that was developed in-house in the central bank and all the banks, all the commercial banks are linked to this system. Thank you. Thanks, Alonzo. I think, it, I think that's the envy of the U.S. to get to where you are. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that's also going in in wholesale payments, and I'm going to turn to Alan, who is joining us virtually, to introduce himself and share some of the work that is going on in Singapore. Thanks, Paul, um, and thank you for the opportunity to join you remotely. So my name is Alan I'm from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the MES, um, Singapore's central bank, integrated financial regulator, and we are also responsible for developing Singapore's financial center. So one of the areas that we've been working on in the last couple of years is to look at how we can improve our um, retail payments in Singapore. So one of the initiatives that we have started was um, PayNow in Singapore, which is really a mechanism to facilitate instant payment systems. So we have done this and uh, enabled 24 by 7 retail payments um, for uh, folks in Singapore. But what we have done also in recent years is look into how we can better support um, this same experience in account-to-account -account transfer using the mobile phone number or a unique entity uh, number as a proxy to figure out a person's bank account and to do this internationally. So we had the opportunity to link our system, our instant payment system with Thailand and more recently with India as well. So we could do basically an account-to-account -account transfer internationally. But we've looked at this um, mechanism to facilitate, I guess, bilateral transfers, uh, bilateral linkages, and really taking a step back to see how we can do this in a more scalable manner. And the approach that we have taken is perhaps to look at this multilaterally. And one of the efforts that we have undertaken, working with the BIS and other central banks, uh, is a project called Project Nexus. That's looking at how we can connect um, this different instant payment systems multilaterally. But what I would call over here is that even as we are looking at instant payment systems and linking them up, what we are really solving with Nexus and all these different initiatives is really the clearing problem. We have not really addressed uh, or changed, I would say, um, what's happening on the settlement link. So with um, instant payment systems in the Nexus example, for example, we have the sender's bank or the debit on the sender's bank account and the credit on the receiver's bank account. But fundamentally, the funds, um, if they are not on the same ledger, the funds or the settlement doesn't happen immediately. So I think that's something to perhaps call out. 
even as we are looking at different efforts, domestically, perhaps a lot of these transfers are operating within a single ledger. But when you, when you consider this uh, happening across borders, we quickly realize that we are not necessarily operating on the same ledger. And there is a question on how these ledgers are actually going to be linked up. One approach perhaps is to link different RTGS systems together. But I think we need to consider whether it's possible or who would operate such a common ledger across borders. There's a question about independence across different jurisdictions. And that's where we start to look at, I guess, the possibilities of uh, distributed ledger technology as a mechanism to solve this issue around cross-border settlement. And we have looked at, I guess, a variety of different methods um, to approach this, one of which is to look into a common settlement platform. We have embarked on a number of initiatives to look at distributed ledger technology to facilitate multi-currency settlement um, involving perhaps local currencies. One example is Project Amba, uh, working with uh, our colleagues in Malaysia, Australia, and South Africa, just looking at how we can facilitate that on a common platform. But I think some of the lessons that we have learned from initiatives such as uh, Tamba, and we see, I guess, equivalent examples uh, across the world, is that perhaps in certain cases, it may not be possible for direct settlement through two, uh, two currency pairs. But perhaps there's a case in which, um, number one, there could be illiquid currencies that involve, and perhaps there's a role for a vehicle currency, such as the US dollar, to reach between these two different currencies. The other broader observation is that perhaps it's not always possible for everyone to participate in the same common ledger. Uh, and perhaps an alternative to that is to look at how we can interlink different ledgers. And this is where we've been, we had the opportunity to work with the New York Fed. And I'm sure Per will speak about that in greater detail. The possibilities of linking different ledgers, even though they are on the different technology stack, um, as well as um, operated on a, on a different basis. How do we do that, but still achieve the benefit of or, or possibilities of atomic settlement on a PBP basis, or in fact, even further on P, VP, VP, and so forth basis. So I think those are the few areas that we've looked into. Um, maybe I'll pass on time back to you, Paul, and, and over to Pear. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Very exciting developments coming out of Singapore. Um, per, can you talk a bit about what's going on in New York? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Paul, and, and thank you, uh, Jalapa, for such a fantastic event and, and convening a really fantastic community and, and wonderful group of people. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Per Von Zelowitz, the director of the New York Innovation Center at the New York Fed. And uh, I'll begin my remarks with a disclaimer that uh, any comments I make are, are my comments only and don't necessarily represent uh, the view of the, the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve. Any references to things like central bank digital currencies or digital assets also don't indicate any policy recommendations, decisions, any intent to launch a CBDC or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and that being said, um, I'll talk a little bit about the New York Innovation Center and then the work that we're doing and, and how that might align with uh, some of Alan's comments and, and some of the, uh, the interest of the panel. Uh, the New York Innovation Center's work is to conduct uh, technical research and experimentation. Um, so uh, we're not focused on policy questions. We're not really focused on legal questions, but trying to understand can we make certain technologies work in the way that we would like them to where we think they should uh, to solve certain types of problems or deliver certain types of opportunities that we think exist, that we think are inherent. Um, and uh, our focus uh, right now is on uh, the digital asset and tokenization domain. Um, so obviously within the whole innovation space, there's lots of interesting topics and topics that are are well worth investing time um, and thought in. And our focus right now is really on the, the potential and opportunity of digital assets and tokenization from a central bank perspective. Um, so the way that we do that is really through a model of collaboration. Um, so we're strong believers uh, that uh, many of the smartest people in the world uh, work somewhere else or exist outside of your own organization. So the way to really conduct um, interesting and, and impactful research in this area is try and bring those people into the work that you're doing. Um, so as Alan mentioned, one of the projects that we've conducted uh, that began um, with what's called Project CEDAR and has in, evolved in the latest phase of work um, to uh, Project CEDAR Phase 2 and, and UBIN Plus, 
uh, not a great project name, um, but uh, describes the work that we did, uh, was in collaboration with uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore um, and Alan's team. Uh, another project that we've uh, recently uh, published the results on is called the Regulated Liability Network, or RLN. And that was a project that was in collaboration uh, with a number of uh, private sector participants, uh, tech vendors, uh, and a law firm. Um, so these are examples of how we'll convene different groups of people um, to work together uh, to ensure that we have different perspectives uh, represented to really test the hypothesis, validate the assumptions that we have together in a way that contains the perspectives of the appropriate stakeholders. So those could be users and customers of the systems, um, and it also could be uh, operators um, and others who, who would have uh, an interest and in, in perspective in ultimately uh, the value proposition that the, the system will deliver. Uh, all of our work begins with identifying, again, a problem, opportunity, and target use case um, to validate and test if it's possible to create a value proposition um, within that specific use case uh, and validate appropriately that value proposition. We don't really care if the value proposition uh, is positively or negatively validated, if it becomes true or not. What we care about is actually the truth. So can we test um, and conduct a research project in an unbiased way? and ultimately determine whether uh, there's a, a positive value proposition or not. So it was interesting on some of the earlier panels uh, with the discussion uh, around stable coins and other topics. Uh, I think a lot of the work that we're all doing at this point in time uh, is somewhere in the process of discovery. Um, so some of the value propositions are not entirely clear at this point in time, um, but a lot of the work that we're conducting is really to try and continue testing those value propositions uh, to determine if we can ultimately identify one uh, that, that is based on evidence and is something that we should actually progress with uh, from a production standpoint. Um, the work that we do in the Innovation Center also, uh, again, is research. So we're not moving towards building production systems. Uh, the projects that I referenced, uh, there's no intent uh, to deploy those as new Fed products or services. And there's also no intent uh, for us to endorse uh, these as necessarily the only or best solution to some of the problems that we're targeting in the market. But they're really opportunities for us to re research and learn uh, and then ultimately help uh, us make more informed decisions about steps that might be taken in the future um, relative to new types of systems, new technologies, um, new products, um, services, those kinds of things. And we also publish much of our research. So if you haven't been to our website um, on the New York Fed uh, website yet, I really encourage you to do that. Uh, and we think there's real value in contributing to uh, the global body of research in this area, uh, the global discussion about the value and potential of these new types of technologies, um, designs, um, models, and those kinds of things. And um, so when we talk about some of the topics that were referenced um, by Alan and some of the focus of this panel, uh, a few of the use cases that we've targeted with the Project CEDAR work and RLN work um, are focused on uh, cross-border payments, um, opportunities within the FX domain, and problems that are inherent uh, typically uh, in the current state that might relate to things like uh, delays in settlement times, um, settlement risk, and the other types of risks that are inherent um, within settlement risk, uh, such as counterparty, um, credit, uh, principal risk, and others. And understanding from a technical standpoint, are there things that we can do today that if not eliminate those risks, can potentially mitigate those risks? Um, so both Project CEDAR and RLN uh, were focused on uh, use cases uh, within cross-border payments, um, both multi-currency and also single-currency uh, cross-border payments. And then again, trying to identify mostly from a technical and, and operational standpoint, can we mitigate risk? Um, there are some substantial learnings that came out of the research, again, that you can read um, in the reports that we've published. Uh, but it's possible with some of the technologies that we've tested, like distributed ledger technology, blockchain, um, tokenized assets of different types, uh, to uh, mitigate theoretically um, some of the, the settlement risk uh, inherent um, in these types of use cases that I, I described earlier. The one uh, uh, caveat that I would mention relative to that also is that we're largely conducting the research from a technical perspective. And there's all kinds of other reasons that these problems exist beyond just the technical problems. So there's legal issues, policy issues, um, there are commercial and business reasons that things work the way that they do. Uh, there's operational um, issues to, to tackle. So technology is not the silver bullet. It's simply one piece of the puzzle. And that's the primary focus that we have um, in the Innovation Center. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Paul. Thanks, Pear. Um, at, as Alan and um, Pear mentioned, there's a lot of work going on in cross-border. Martin, um, would you kindly kind of share some more insights into what's happening in the cross-border payment space? 
Sure. So thank you, Jalapa, first for the invitation and for bringing so many great people and great content here. Um, I'm going to try to bring some a little bit spicier take uh, related. My focus is on China. I'm a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. First, I have to show my book, which came out the end of last year called The Cashless Revolution, where I wrote about uh, fintech and uh, and digital payments and especially digital currency in China. Uh, I'm going to make three points about China today. Uh, one of them is uh, about retail. The other two are about the wholesale cross-border side. Uh, the first is that the ECNY uh, Chinese digital currency project for now is a bit more of a cautionary tale than uh, something to be a, a night think is a nightmare for the Federal Reserve. Uh, in that uh, it's been very difficult for China to convince anybody to actually use the ECNY. Uh, it's used when people are given free money and given one month to spend it. They spend that money and then uh, they never open the wallet again. And so I think it's really interesting to think, why are we so afraid of this in the United States? And and one interesting pattern is to look at every single retail CBDC that exists in uh, in the world today. I don't think you can find a single one which you would say is a success. It's not used in the Bahamas. It's not used in um, Nigeria. It's, uh, it, one of them was down in the Caribbean, I think, for uh, for a few months, and I don't think anybody really noticed. Uh, so, the, why is this so so important? I think I think there's there's a big question there. And if you compare that with the success of UPI and PIX and what we heard today about Costa Rica, it's a really interesting question. Why does it have to be a CBDC? Uh, why is it so important for people to transact with? Uh, with central bank money versus commercial bank money. And I think, you know, the fact that China with such a strong government with so many resources to put behind this program has been unable to get people to use it, I think is a major red flag for countries looking at the retail side. Uh, so that's the first point. The second is on cross, cross border. It, it's not clear to me what the direction of technology is and whether or not being ahead or behind in CBDC and all these pilots that are being done really matters uh, at this point from a fundamental perspective. You know, you don't want to be the, the leading uh, technology provider for Betamax if uh, VHS ends up winning. And so we don't know what the future of technical standards looks like in this space. Uh, I think standards is thrown out a lot in the United States of, oh, China is going to set the standards. In the, um, in the MCBDC bridge, project, I think there is an interesting risk for the United States in that China has written the code. And in these systems, code is law. So I think that's interesting to look at. But outside of that, the real standards that matter is, we all know, probably in this room, ISO 20022. Uh, that uh, is a largely U.S. determined standard and will remain so. And then what actually determines the standards of how people transact is done by the actual infrastructure and the rules around participation. And so there, I think there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether all of the cross-border CBC arrangements we have so far will actually develop into a real infrastructure or if it's just an interesting technological exercise. I mean, Embridge is currently relatively early stage. And the last point I'll make is that uh, it's echoing something Per just said, which is that it's a lot of this is not about uh, technology. Uh, many of the reasons that cross-border payments today are slow, uh, are often at least slow, expensive, clunky, low-tech, uh, have nothing to do with technology and much more about the existence of financial infrastructure, where is their liquidity, and fundamentally, if I were to boil this all down to one thing, it's access. And a lot of, I think, what we're talking about when we talk about cross-border CBDCs, there's this assumption that we're going to expand access. This was talked about earlier. Will we expand it to new fintech companies? A lot of the potential global impact of CBDC is will the U.S., for example, allow non-resident banks uh, access to USD uh, paint, clearing and settlement infrastructure. I think there's a big question mark there. There's a reason that correspondent banking networks have been collapsing, and that's because there's a trade-off of AML and access. And so far, AML has won that uh, every single time. So if I were to look at what, what China's done and say, is this a threat to the United States? What do we need to learn from it? Uh, I'd say it's probably not a threat uh, in the near and medium term. In part, that's due to capital controls in China, which are not going anywhere. In fact, they're getting stricter. Uh, another is that uh, we just lack, uh, the CNY lacks liquidity. Um, and uh, it's currently the fifth most used currency. So you see all of these headlines about BRICS, BRICS using the ECN, the BRICS using uh, the renminbi, 
and all the increase due to sanctions that uh, that has led the the Chinese yuan to go up by 50 percent in usage over the last two years. It's gone from two to three percent, still the fifth most used currency in the world. And none of that gain is due to the ECNY whatsoever. So I'd say we can probably not sit on our laurels. I agree with uh, with Aaron that there is a real risk of complacency in this because there are major problems uh, in this system. But I don't necessarily think uh, that CBDC is the way to solve it. And that CBDC is often a distinction without a difference when we're talking about the wholesale side, because we already have digital forms of central bank money that underlie all the infrastructures we're talking about. Thanks, Martin. Um, Rusiru, may I ask you to introduce yourself and share a bit about uh, what uh, the Clearinghouse is doing? Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Jalapa, for inviting and organizing this great event. Um, my responsibility is the RTP network. That is the real-time payments network, which has been live for five years. We went live in 2017, and this is the sixth year in operation in the United States. Uh, the Clearinghouse operates three major networks and a, a check uh, image clearing uh, platform as well. Uh, so we are a side-by-side -side operator of the three major networks. In the real-time payments network, uh, we have now over 370 plus institutions live. We just um, surpassed the 1 million transactions a day limit. Um, so we had um, that success. We continue to see the network growing. I think the real-time payments are now uh, a thing of a need for all the financial institutions and their clients. We also see new use cases being adopted. Uh, today in the morning, I heard about the, um, the Uber drivers getting paid, and uh, the, the speaker thought it's uh, too visa direct. But that's one of the prominent use cases we see on the RTP network, gig economy workers getting paid for uh, what they work that day so that they have money to pump gas. Uh, digital wallet drawdowns, um, earn wage access, those are some uh, prominent use cases we see uh, growing on the RTP network. We also uh, recently went into the market adoption phase of um, RFP, request for payment or request to pay in uh, some other jurisdictions, we call it. Uh, that is certainly going to revolutionize bill pay, uh, where the customer gets uh, the capability to control the funds uh, movement or the payment through a secure uh, digital channel, uh, request for pay. It's not like a direct debit uh, being hit against your account um, without your control. Um, so those are some of the um, key aspects of the RTP network. Moving to cross-border, that's also uh, within uh, my responsibility, working with different jurisdictions to um, interconnect existing immediate payment systems. I uh, agree with uh, some of the comments around uh, uh, why uh, try to uh, adopt some up-and-coming technologies which are not mature. I'm not against a new technology. I'm also a techie by profession. Uh, before I took over the responsibility of RTP network, I implemented the payment hub on a third-party service provider to connect to Zelle and RTP. So I came to the industry into the clearinghouse. So I saw firsthand the challenges in the industry uh, where the technology platforms are very disconnected. There are multiple layers of technology stacks, and we are burdened by the legacy technology platforms we have here today. Um, so certainly, I think we need to look at uh, how we um, solve cross-border payments with immediate payment systems, which are already existing. They do the, uh, the, the business in their jurisdiction better than anyone else. So that's the goal of IXB, uh, the uh, immediate cross-border payments initiative by the Clearinghouse to connect immediate cross-border payment platforms across the globe. Thanks, Rizu. So we have about 20, 20 um, something minutes. So um, we're going to go into the Q&A session. Um, a question that I often think about is, is what problem are we solving with some of the innovation work that you're doing? Aside from speed of payments, what else are you all thinking about in terms of the pain points in, in our financial system? I can go first. I, I would say um, uh, security. That's a top of uh, mind concern when you come to uh, payment systems, whether it's domestic or um, cross-border. I think um, Clearinghouse takes uh, very seriously the security and, and the soundness of the payment system and the efficiency. Uh, also, the scale is very important. You want to look at uh, payment system to scale fast. Um, so today, when you make the technology choices, uh, that is also important. For the security and soundness and fraud mitigation, I always encourage the key industry players to collaborate. 
uh, whether it's the Fed, whether it's other uh, payment systems or the directory owners to collaborate, because that's the only way we could mitigate fraud. Um, so that's I would I would start with that. Yeah, if I if I can add here, um, it it really depends on what we are talking about in terms of what problem we are we are trying to 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 solve. Uh, if if we take a look at strictly that at the payment landscape or the existing payment instruments and so on, uh, of course, each jurisdiction will, would have its own problem. We we uh, we took a, a very deep dive study before we launched PIX, and in that sense, we tried to identify each problem that we had in our in our uh, retail payment landscape in order to establish uh, a new payment scheme, a new, a new payment system to tackle those those challenges, those problems. So you have to understand your own problem before you you move on. So. We clearly had uh, problems on financial inclusion, on cost, cost for merchants, um, in terms of um, uh, speed of the of the uh, the payment, low speed. Like the, the, as I said, the credit card payment uh, will deliver the the funds. Will deliver the funds in in 30 days, and so so uh, we. Design, design and picks in order to tackle those uh, those problems. So you have to understand that. Uh, the second uh, the second aspect is how you really implement that uh, system that you design or or, or imagine uh, that it would be solve that problem. So that leads to the to again to the point uh, that I was making in terms of how the central bank should step in. Because it was, there was clearly a, a, a coordination problem in the market. I mean, a very complex financial system. Uh, we have, we don't have access problems to to our RTGS or to our to our system. We have uh, full access for banks, non banks, and so on. Uh, since uh, since uh, I mean, for for more than ten years. Uh, but the, but this this complex uh, complex environment. Uh, didn't end up or didn't allow that the market would come up with a solution to to tackle those uh, those uh, those problems and we we actually actually uh, challenged the market to do that so in 2014 was the first time that we published a a, a report stating that we would like to see an instant pay, an instant payment solution to uh, solve those problems and and problem a b and c and there was like a few years with no action from the market, just because there was no uh, possibility to all the players, the incumbents, the 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 the, the new players, the fintechs, and so on, to agree uh, with one specific solution. So that's why the central bank stepped in, and that's I mean, kind of uh, it's the other side of the story. Uh, not only the technical aspect, the design of the system, but uh, but actually. Uh, regulators or central bank pushing the, the, the market to get the solution. And that, that of course, uh, also is the case for the cross-border payments, which, uh, in my view, requires a political action, um, a reaction from the regulators and so on. It's not only the technical aspect is that it really prevents us to move forward. And... Um... Certainly, we'll we'll echo some of the earlier comments where um, each use case really has a unique set of problems. Um, so there's really no common uh, problem across payment systems, but each use case requires very specific analysis and interrogation to understand what's the the unique problem and unique opportunity within that use case. Um, and I'll I'll start perhaps with a, another uh, a controversial comment, um, which is actually the the payment systems work pretty well today. So I've I've heard a lot of uh, complaints about payment systems and uh, and share a lot of those complaints. But what they actually enable today is pretty remarkable, um, given uh, uh, given where we are. So uh, I'll acknowledge that. Uh, but then also say that there's certainly opportunities for substantial improvement. And that's what we should focus on is how do we how do we actually deliver that um, that improvement? And uh, and how do we improve on what is is a pretty remarkable system that we have? 
Uh, and one area uh, that has been referenced earlier also, I think, is access. And if you look at at cross-border payments and, and multi-currency um, cross-border, for example, um, and a project that we worked on um, with Alan and the MAS uh, was the, the project Cedar 2 Ubin Plus um, research that we conducted. And one of the opportunities there that we explored was the opportunity to deliver um, payment versus payment like um, safety and efficiency to uh, currency corridors, parts of the, uh, the cross-border payments market that simply don't have that available to them today. Um, so if you think about um, uh, CLS, the FMI uh, that delivers PVP to a number of, of currencies today in the world, uh, there's a larger number of currencies, which is actually the, the fastest growing part of the FX market that doesn't have payment versus payment available um, to them. And imagine if that sort of uh, efficiency and, uh, and safety was available to that much wider range of currencies, what are the potential positive implications for uh, cross-border trade, um, for uh, uh, potential positive implications for the economies uh, of, those, uh, of those currencies? Uh, so we think that's a really interesting uh, area to try and think about, to try and research and understand uh, how can we possibly uh, introduce improvements to uh, the payment system focused on on those types of markets, for example. So usually the governor of the bank tells us, and he tells me very persistently, read the law, understand it, and that is your pretty much your, your main guide, your only guide. And the law of the Central Bank of Costa Rica talks about the, an efficient payment system. We have a division within the bank that works with the payment system uh, to maintain it, to, to, um, to make sure that uh, it's live 24-7, but they also work in improving the system. One of the goals of having this mobile payment system is to reduce the cost. Because if we move back, if we go back two, three decades in Costa Rica, pretty much a lot of the transactions were made in cash, which is very expensive. There are, uh, there, there's this anecdote of an uh, ATM at the entry of the supermarket. You take out the cash, you go and purchase everything, you pay in, with the cashier in the, in the supermarket, and then this uh, currency is taken out in a safe, counted everywhere, and put it back again in the ATM. The goal is to reduce this cost because it's not uh, it's a significant part of the G of the GDP of a country, especially a country like like ours. Um, of the transactions that were not made in cash and impose this cost to the society or, or to the, the parties involved, there were also um, a lot of fees to pay with card debit or credit card. Uh, which in, in our case, it was the same. There are a lot of fees. So the, the, the action of the bank goes into the, into the direction of reducing that cost, that cost. And that is the main goal and that is the main objective that we have when we think about this and when we propose new solutions. On the, uh, an additional consequence of this, which is not exactly the goal, is that we've increased the access of financial instruments of uh, Costa Ricans uh, in this time frame. That is probably why the banks have been open to being part of this system in which, for the most part, for these small transactions, it's subsidized because it's free for the customer and free for the, for the customers that are making the transaction. That means that both the central bank and the commercial banks are uh, taking the cost of doing these transactions. But if you have 20 additional percentage points of population uh, having access to financial to the financial system where they can monetize the commercial banks monetize uh, the use that they uh, have of this system uh, then it's a great out outcome for everyone um, so I, I go back that was my answer but I, I'll use uh, one more minute to talk about the, the, the CBDC, why we haven't thought of a CBDC. We actually have something like a CBDC. Anyone can open an account in the central bank and make transactions from that. But it's not very useful compared to using commercial, uh, the, the money that people have in commercial banks. So if we, if we lower the cost, make it efficient, everyone has access to it, there's not much point on having a CBDC. One thing I, I need to say is that the, the limit that we are reaching is how to improve our cross-border payment system. 
there are a lot of regional banks in Central America and South America that make that solution easy for the customers within the network. Um, that's one possibility, and that's a private sector contributing to this. Uh, but in terms of central bank and money uh, moving across borders, not, uh, not within this regional bank, we have this challenge, which is a, uh, the, the greatest challenge that we have so far. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of innovation going on, some that's good, um, some that's groundbreaking, and, and some that sort of are, are, is a cause for concern. Um, what do you worry about with respect to uh, the potential future payments landscape? And um, let me start with Alan, since you're, you're joining us virtually. So I guess uh, from my perspective, um, even as we're looking at new forms of representation of in central bank, uh, liability in a new form for like various varieties of tokenized assets. My, I guess my concern is that we have creating, in fact, greater fragmentation in the ecosystem. You have new digital islands of uh, isolation uh, that are occurring. Um, doesn't mean that you are, you are using blockchain or distributed ledger technology. You're immediately better connected. In fact, there would be arguments to be made that some of the efforts uh, from a private blockchain perspective that leads to greater fragmentation. So I think we need to look at that holistically uh, uh, and, and really understand, um, you know, is there, is there a path forward that helps us to achieve the outcome that we want? Uh, I think there could be argument to be made that we want greater access, but yet also ensuring that the necessary guardrails are in place to ensure that financial services remain uh, efficient, remains uh, accessible and possibly uh, cheaper for uh, the, the users of the system. I, I, I think from a central bank and from a regulator perspective, I think that's the goal. Uh, whether it's on a decentralized set of technology or otherwise, I don't think that's the driver. So I think it's important to have that perspective as we approach uh, some of these uh, challenges. Yeah, I agree that fragmentation is important. And one of them might be if you move away from the U.S. dollar-based uh, international payment system, you then fragment liquidity, where if, if you're a country that has to manage just one exchange rate, things are a lot easier and all liquidity is, is there. And then you have very low spreads. And I'm worried about like a fragmentation driven by geopolitics or by technology that would then split that liquidity and what the implications would be for spreads and the stability of the system. Uh, another is is disruption and disintermediation of the banking system. I think it's really interesting to watch how central banks get excited about the disruptive potential of CBDCs, both domestically and internationally, but then uh, kind of shrink back at the potential implications of that and just how many unknown uh, unknowns there are in relation to issuing, doing expanding the border of government closer and closer to to handling retail payments and how and how many entry points there potentially are for cyber threats and uh, and other problems Mr. I would agree I think with interconnectedness you are going to have a new set of problems uh, which definitely opens up for cyber threat and and uh, and, and uh, entry points coming with a lot of erroneous transactions right um, the uh, the other one, I think, is more the um, openness of payment networks to um, um, all. Uh, I think uh, you touched on that as well, where you have to uh, make sure that there is no dominance in uh, what we implement uh, and it's more inclusive um, to, to other jurisdictions as well. Uh, I think um, going back to some of the previous comments, you have to look at we don't have that uh, central authority telling us what to do, and we have thousands of financial institutions, payment processors, fintechs. So we have to be more inclusive um, here in the United States than other uh, countries because we have a very, very diverse population of uh, financial technology providers in our ecosystem. Uh, so those are some of the challenges we definitely need to keep in mind as we implement um, new uh, payment uh, rails or uh, improve upon existing payment rails, right? 
Um, I totally agree with the comment also. Our payment uh, systems are not broken. They are working well. I think we do have improvements we need to do because the customer demands and behaviors are changing. And that's exactly what we try to do, even with the Clearinghouse and RTP network. We try to see what the banks and credit union customers are wanting tomorrow. What will they need in three to five years? and try to build that capabilities today so that we can learn lessons and slowly uh, uh, ramp up those uh, use cases or technologies to serve those needs in the future. I think um, some of the concerns uh, and and uh, these areas certainly are being researched and, and thought about, um, but every new technology, every new design, uh, new system, uh, certainly opens up opportunity uh, for some of the risks that we're currently actively working to try and manage. Um, so um, CFT, uh, uh, sac sanction screening, uh, these sorts of risks, um, they exist in the current system. Uh, there's ongoing work to, to manage them and mitigate them in the current system. And anytime there's a new system, there's a whole host of unknowns where we need to continue to, to try and address um, many of these risks. And as we think about uh, some of the the trends that are taking place and the concepts that we've discussed um, on this panel and earlier panels, uh, many of which I, I agree with and I think uh, have many potential positive benefits. So things like decentralization um, in certain use cases and certain um, aspects, uh, things like unbundling, uh, those uh, certainly present significant opportunity, um, but also risk in these areas. So uh, our, a lot of our focus still is on maintaining uh, the mission of the, of the Federal Reserve and the safety and soundness of the financial system. And what we don't want to have happen is any new type of innovation or technology uh, risking the, the safety and soundness of the financial system. I think the, the main concern, at least that we, we have, is regarding the cybersecurity and resilience of the system, right? Because it's um, a lot of the transactions in the country, uh, peer to peer, are work around this system. So mm, there is a primary concern of the bank of working, uh, trying to avoid or to mitigate the security risks that this uh, poses around. And the other point uh, that I wanted to make is the, the one that I said before, that the cross-border payments is, is pretty much an area that, that we need to uh, address. In Usually, it would be easier for us to solve it in terms of a regional uh, Central America, maybe the Caribbean at least, uh, but we are still in a very early stages of that discussion. And not all countries are in the same um, spot, like in terms of how advanced we are. So that makes a bit difficult the, 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 that progress. Well, I think uh, I, I might close here with, uh, with a provocative uh, remark here. Uh, I think the PIX case uh, showed at least to, 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 to the Central Bank of Brazil that we can take more than more from the, the existing payment infrastructure and the existing uh, technology right so uh, there are a lot of room to get what we have already have and make it better make it more efficient and 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 keep doing that over time so that's another important aspect here we implemented big so we know that uh, it has we have seen massive great adoption but we still see room for improvement in the pix ecosystem we have a lot of new products new features in in our roadmap in our future roadmap so we're working right now in the recurring payment uh, facility for pix we are also prospecting uh, ways to improve the the cross-border payments using pix we have new technologies for starting the payments using nfc and so on um, in our case, so I think one important aspect for the future which concerns me is that we have to, we must have this mindset of keep innovating and we, we can innovate with the existing technology. But of course, that doesn't mean that we don't have to welcome new technologies, uh, uh, innovations from, from uh, other technologies, other uh, uh, I mean, different types of uh, or different approaches in terms of payments. 
but we have to do it in a safe way, in a way that doesn't disrupt, that doesn't uh, have uh, negative externalities uh, in the existing payment landscape that we have. Thanks, Carlos. We are at time, and I want to thank our, our panelists for sharing their insights. I want to encourage you all to uh, approach them and continue the conversation during break and um, lunch and, and whatever else is going on. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.